Hi, I'm Othias, and this is Webley's number four revolver, specifically a very late pattern of the number four revolver. Just about everyone knows this as the Webley price, but as far as I can tell, there's not a lick of price in this gun, and Thomas Webley would likely agree. We'll explain all of that and more after the light box. With an overall length clearing 10.5 inches and weighing in at 2.2 pounds, this is actually a fairly stout, old-world, large-bore, black powder revolver, at least at its conception. The top brake action allows you to feed or eject six rounds of 476, that was the commercial realm's term for the Enfield Mark II cartridge. Before we get into our story today, don't forget that this episode, along with all of the rest, are products bought and paid for by you, the viewer. Please consider kicking in just a buck or two a month so we can keep the history coming. We do actually have a continued sponsor right now of the show. That would be, hold on, Ballastol. I didn't prepare this at all. It lives here because I've been using this for a while. Now we left off our Ballastol mini-sodes with its adoption by the German army in 1904. This was thanks to its unique characteristics, which made it more than a universal CLP, but also extended into the realm of wound oils. Well, even before the Great War, German and Austrian experts were singing the praises of Ballastol for its excellent prevention of rust. Yes, independent testing at the time did confirm it to be among the best known for preventing rust when used down the bore after a rifle or pistol had been fired. But there were other products capable of this feat. Two elements stood clearly in Ballastol's favor, though. One, it was water-soluble and yet remained effective even when diluted. This is a key feature for soldiers and their rifles who were often exposed to the elements. Two, Ballastol did not harden when left to dry, unlike some other notorious products we often see in old guns today. More on that next time, though, because we have another story to tell you right now. At least, I'm going to attempt to. In all honesty, this is going to be one of those episodes that I hope eventually gets rewritten a few years down the road. The Webley Price is a well-known and beloved historical firearm, and yet it comes from a horribly murky era. And not just one, but two dizzyingly confusing towns. Liège in Belgium, and Birmingham in England the twin beating hearts of the evolution of the modern revolver. And it's no small wonder, because they are very similar cities. Both are storied homes for independent arms production, industries made up of a myriad network of inventors, producers, suppliers, and even more numerous individual lock filers, messenger boys, etc. Each of these cities has been described as something of a mega factory onto itself. With uh, the right financial incentives, nearly their whole population could be put into production of arms in an emergency. More important for today, though, both cities benefited from a culture of financial collaboration. Uh, you see, one man might have a great invention, worthy of selling some 20,000 units into the market. However, his own home shop, at best, produced three or four pieces a day. So, our inventor would license out his invention for a small royalty on each firearm produced. This meant the market would soon bloom, with a lot of mechanically similar products, but each with its own variation in maker, and of course, no two parts interchangeable. This was fine for arms owned by individuals, but a mess for military contracts. It soon became the aim of every small shop to become one large enough to spawn large numbers of identical firearms serial production. And yes, we know in hindsight, Webley would achieve just that a decade after this revolver came to market under their name. And this model in particular trailed nearly another decade behind its core features being invented in Liège by a man who was actually named Philippe Joseph Conet, who was probably a junior. Um, this can get a little difficult because he has largely evaded biography. But from what we do know, Conet was born in 1837, growing up in the uh, Saint-Rémy district of Blenny, near Liège. He was the son of a lock filer and seems to have followed in his father's footsteps. Philippe was registered with the Liège Proof House from 1865 to 1905. And that's actually about it for what we know, which is a shame, as we'll find that he was quite influential, like with this patent of his from 1871. 
which covered a break-action self-extracting revolver using a spring-loaded horizontal crosspin retracted by pressing on the lower pad of an operating lever. It's worth noting, by the way, that Kone also reveals a simplified ejector lever far in advance of the Schofield patent of 1873, though there is a catch here which we'll see in a moment. That same year, he would file a frankly better drawn patent in France for the same spring lever arrangement and including the same simplified ejector. It's unlikely that Kone produced more than a handful of his own revolver. Instead, it seems he licensed the design fairly widely in Liège and later Birmingham. This has unfortunately made putting a timeline on these pieces more than a little difficult. However, we can hit the high notes. Early examples of Kone revolvers likely looked a lot like this. One release lever on the left side, a very simple barrel assembly. Kone did not patent a lockwork, and we can't see inside this revolver, but we do know that it has a three screw setup, meaning one for the trigger, one for the hammer, and in all likelihood, one for the sear. Firearms of this type include the Tranter, the RIC, and common to Belgium precursors to the Chamlo Delvin. This particular example appears to use Kone's patented ejector arm, because we can see an extending tab, and yet no other sort of clutch mechanism. If you're wondering what I mean by that mechanism, well, I happen to have something of an example here. It is an early Kone design, although not quite the one with the lever. The ejector system is the same though, so let's get a closer look. All right. Choosy beggar's time because we have what is actually a Kone patent revolver. It's labeled as such. It's a single and double action top break revolver. However, it doesn't use Kone's lever on the side. Instead, it uses a push button to overcome that lock. This isn't really the feature we're worried about right now, though. We really want to talk about extraction so that you can understand the early 450-ish type of extractors. So if I press this button and tip this guy forward, you'll see that nothing's happened until I go ahead and keep pushing. Then we get our extraction. And we can do it as soft or as smart as we'd like. And when we let it spring back, as a matter of fact, that does it on its own. When we let it spring back, she's ready to load. This is how they were all originally set up. And it's a very simple mechanism in order to accomplish that because it just uses this tooth right here, which engages against the frame. That little guy meets right here. As a matter of fact, you can see where this has been slammed a bit. There's a little bit of a divot. Now, the reason you're seeing that divot is because there's no slip by. There's no clutch mechanism, as you might call it. Instead, this guy always impacts and is always held out. He can't snap back on his own. We have to release the tension. The plunger always has pressure. Now, a comparable system at the time would have been from Smith & Wesson. This is a number three Russian, but the same basic setup would have been on everything before this gun anyway. So if you want to think of maybe what most people recognize as the first extractor, at least the most known one, we'll tip this guy up. She'll extract, right? Oop. Extract, extract. And then at some point we go over center and clunk. She goes ahead and snaps back in on her own in order for us to load up. This feat is actually accomplished with ratchet teeth in the case of the Smith & Wesson, but we still have an interaction down here at the bottom of the frame, although in this case, it's with a lever. See how I can move that guy? Because I'm able to depress the lever, we're able to do a neat trick. If I pop this guy open, start her up, we'll see if she's extracting, but if I hold the button, oh, no extraction because we never engage the tooth. This is a handy feature that was not included in the original Kone's. Kone himself attempted to improve his design with a slip over spring system. However, I have not yet seen a revolver constructed on his 1872 patent. So the single pin slow retracting ejector version of the Kone revolver likely saw a trickle of sales for just a couple years. Our example here, by the way, was produced by August Frankot, a large manufacturer and even blender of numerous uh, inventors' patents, each being paid a small royalty on their sales. I wish that I could date this particular piece. However, I have yet to find a good resource on Frankot firearms in production in terms of when they were made which is a real shame because a lot of questions could be answered by such a resource. Even if I just had access to their catalogs 
in totality, but unfortunately the few I know of are from much later on in the 1890s and 1900s, when what we'd really like to know has more to do with the 1870s. Now I also have a project going on with several excellent helpers trying to document every revolver patent that we can lay our hands on around the world. Much of this episode is built on that effort, and yet we're still missing large gaps as the Belgian archives in particular did some weird organizational tricks making key patents hard to find. It's likely that in one of these gaps we'll eventually find the answer to when the, let's call it the Mark II Kone revolver emerged, which is something that looks like this. This massive handgun is 12 and a half inches in length and weighs in at a whopping 2.5 pounds. It of course uses the Kone top brake system, two levers allowing you to eject six cases. In this case, I'm going to tentatively say the 455 Enfield Mark II cartridge, although you will see we didn't have proof data and went a little lighter than that. Once again, I have to reiterate, we are running wide open without a clear map or really any road signs, especially when we're in Belgium. Imagine navigating an abandoned highway with various rotted billboards, never knowing if they were 10 years old or 50 years old. What we do know is that this was produced by August Frankot, and it was credited to Philippe Conet's patent, and it boasts nearly all the features we'll see on the Webley number four. It's very, very likely that this little guy predates the Webley version entirely, and yet this big lad was probably produced after Webley's first version of the Conet patent, which means that I'm about to get a little out of order on our dates, but I am limited by the examples I have here, and I very much want to show you Kone's work before we wander over to England, because so far this is actually a purely Belgian revolver. Let's take a closer look. All right, ooh, we have, well, honestly, what almost looks British on sight, but is that because the British were influenced by the Belgians or the Belgians influenced by the British? Hmm. Regardless, this is an all Belgian gun. This guy is made by Frank Cott, designed by Kone, and the lock work is from a man named Fanyu. But let's get into more detail here. Looking at her, yes, she is titanic. She's also very worn out. We have tons of pitting at the front. Uh, the finish is now a dull gray from having been recovered from frankly horrific conditions. However, uh, looking at this gun as it was pulled apart and reassembled, I don't see a single uh, sign of bluing, and I don't think anybody had pulled it apart for a full strip either. I also don't see any sign of nickel. I suspect that this was a polished steel gun at its inception, and therefore, since it's become so disfigured on the surface, that it just looks so wacky because of the lack of any ability to polish it now without really, you know, polishing it down to a couple thou thickness all the way around. But we have a single action mm -hmm, and double action mm -hmm, revolver with a Kone locking lever on not just one side, but on two. More on that in a second. We also have some very classic styling. We have a long barrel with a top rib. We have a little bit of ornamentation here that's completely unnecessary. Uh, just to point it out from our earlier firearm, this uses an ejection system in the Kone Arbor. It had no need for the cap. It could be just flushed off. They decided to go a lot prettier. On the back end, we have a one piece uh, wooden grip of a very British style with a metal cap screwed on the bottom. This tang comes on down to here. This is fairly open at the back. Now, let me get a good look at that. Yep, see, both ways around, one continuous piece wrapped around. Now, let's talk about the actual Kone part of this, these, these latches. At the core of all this are these two locking levers. We have to depress both in order to open the gun. They are independent, by the way. Each one is sprung by a flat spring underneath, and at the top, they hold on to a pin. Each pin is linking the uh, frame to the top strap of the barrel assembly. If we depress both, we can actually open up the firearm and therefore get into the cylinder. If I bring that back forward and close her up, Yep, we're good. These guys are tapered in such a way, as a matter of fact, you can probably see them there. Yep, see the tapering? They're tapered so that you can just slam it shut and it'll still work out just fine. Now, while we're back here, because we have the shot, I might as well point out something that's very interesting on this firearm, which is this inlaid German silver triangle. This is designed to help draw the eye to the front sight, which is quite distant and quite small. I'm not sure if I'm able to really do that with my little monitor very well. Oh, hoo, hoo, yeah. Thank crap for that triangle. 
The extraction system is a lot like the Smith & Wesson we saw, more so like a Schofield, which I don't happen to have on hand, but it uses this little arm with its own tab, uh, easier seen in animation later, but uh, it has a little notch tooth right here in order to catch conceivably on the frame like we saw before. Unlike before though, you'll see that we actually have another lever on the frame at the point where the catch meets. This serves sort of like a clutch in the sense that it will hold this lever for a certain amount of time. And then when the two pieces of the frame come together, it pinches this guy into rising out of the way. See how I can flex on that? When it flexes out of the way, it releases this to snap down. Let's take a look. Open her up. It goes ahead and snags at the base of the frame. We keep opening. Eventually, the two little pieces of frame come together that pinches the lever out of the way and boom, we're ready to load. So that means we can, in one snap, eject all six cases and ready the pistol for loading six fresh cartridges. This knob right here is part of the removal process for the cylinder. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure where this comes from in terms of inventors. In 1874, however, Alexandre Fanu developed a combination lever, which also served both as a latch for the side plate and a key for the arbor. I'm unsure if this covers the whole concept of a rotating release, or if it was only permitted as a patent due to its dual purpose nature. The way this guy works is we simply turn it counterclockwise. It's a bit stiff on this old restored bird. There we go. And with the arrow pointing backwards, the cylinder will now be free. So. If I go ahead and open up the action, we can kind of give it a little wiggle and pressure. And sure enough, that cylinder is free to come out of the firearm. Looking at this guy more carefully, we have, well, I know it looks like a near full circle, like three quarters of a circle. But what we're really working with is half of the circle in which that uh, knob turns the lower portion there and it holds it from being able to be pulled out of the gun. When it gets flipped 180, we therefore can align with this little guy and slip right on out. On the underside, we have a groove cut for our little uh, extractor finger, and this is the little piston for extractor. So if we push on that guy, our extractor should pop out the other end. A bit hard to do unsupported though right now, as you can tell, the arbor itself wants to move at the moment. Normally the arbor would be held still, the plunger would move, the extractor would come out, and you get the idea. When you want to put this guy back in, it's important to index this correctly with this groove at the bottom, lining up with a little lever arm in there. There she is, that's the finger that's been pressing on our extractor this entire time. Right now it's being held by the frame. If I continue opening the firearm, it'll eventually click over and then it's free to fall down in there. There's no spring tension at the moment, so it's kind of riding, but as you can see, I can poke it right on in. If we close her up and pop her free, you'll see there she reappears. And at full peak, she's no longer supported and will fall back in. Those of you with eagle eyes might have noticed that unlike the Webley that we're going to see or have seen before, actually, the RIC is the number four, this is a two-screw gun. We have one here for the trigger, one here for the hammer. There is no third screw for a sear, which would have been used for single action cocking the hammer. Instead, it uses two extensions on the hammer, one fixed for single action and one folding for double. The lower arm of the mainspring presses on a lever in order to rebound the hammer. This rebounding feature is critical for safe operation of the revolver. You see, it's a little unlikely, but you could, in theory, load up your six rounds on this firearm, and then with one chamber lined up just right, and of course the primer in front of what would be a forward firing pin, uh, this guy is retracted because he's auto-rebounded, you could snap and maybe get a strike on that primer, discharging the firearm. Now that does require a fairly soft primer and therefore we don't see this as a general opinion from companies like say Smith & Wesson who still had manual rebounders even on their triple action uh, later revolvers. But uh, for Liège and Britain, this is a necessary feature, a very good safety feature. Again, while we can't pin down the date, I do believe this to be both the pinnacle and quintessential Belgian Kone revolver. So, at least it addresses the Liège involvement. Now, despite its rough condition, I know what you're thinking. And the answer is, yes, we did shoot it.
<laughs> Again, it looks like this guy would handle 455 or 476 black powder cartridges, but we erred on the side of Adams because we had no idea what it was actually proved at. There are no markings for the cartridge on this gun, and it's fairly worn. I did, however, manage to get it in good time. Now, exploring the Belgian Kone is plenty of fun. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, not to mention chamberings. But what about other countries? The Kone top break found favor in Austria and the Balkans, where it was merged with the popular Frankot lockwork and frame profile. There's some evidence that these were also popular in the Ottoman Empire proper. I will honestly leave that topic for further exploration another day, and instead turn your attention back to our original theme the British market, which by the mid-1870s was abuzz with the notion of a self-extracting revolver. Early examples of which include Thomas's self-extracting bulldog revolver, a solid frame extractor. The Galand action of 1868, as later modified by Somerville, of course, a sliding extractor. The Hill patent, which was really a Belgian Girard tip-up extractor, and certainly our own Belgian Cornet pattern hinged top brake extractor. The future was clearly automatic extraction. In hindsight, we know it certainly was for Britain, but by 1876 or so, this was still just educated speculation. The army was still firmly planted on a solid frame gate loader with a singular ejecting rod. Uh, regardless, sometime around 1877, a new type of Kone pattern revolver appears in the British market, one that looks like this gun here with its turn screw cylinder release. Now, who was the first to bring it into the new market, and especially who was the first to produce in England, is a little bit of a mystery to me. However, there is one man clearly most associated with the Kone in Britain, and that man is actually Charles Price the Younger. And unfortunately, he's an awful mystery of a person with crisscrossing recorded dates that make it impossible to be sure of just which Price he is. That's because the name Charles Price was uh, well established in Birmingham. While I don't have a photograph of him, Charles Price the Older is much better documented, beginning with a workshop in 1838 on St. Mary's Row. He reformed in 1840 as Price and Company, particularly dedicated to the production of pistols. Conveniently, my friend Jonathan actually just covered a Price and Cashmore revolver if you'd like to see more of Price's other early inventions. In 1841, the original Charles Price partnered with Richard Redman and branched into both sporting arms and military contracts. In the early 1860s, they were known for producing the Dean and Harding revolver off of Harding's 1858 patent. They also made a fair bit of coin selling arms into the American Civil War, and then made headlines in 1867 due to a murder at their workshop. Apparently James Scott, cashier to Price and Redmond, had been embezzling funds and was both found out and accused by John Price, brother of Charles the Older. Scott apparently took up one of their revolvers and shot down Price, whereupon Charles and his partner Redmond tackled the now murderer and attempted to wrestle his gun away. Charles Price took a round into the hand for his effort, but did manage to seize the revolver and summarily beat Scott over the head with it, subduing him for the authorities. The elder Price would apparently leave Redmond in 1873. I've seen it recorded that this was due to his death, but that doesn't seem to line up very well with other biographical data. With the firm separated, we now have Charles Price and Company once more, which did take up the manufacture of Kone's revolvers in Birmingham. These were largely sold under names like Thomas Bland and the Cartridge Brand. You can usually spot an original price by the patent number in a diamond, usually on the right side. This patent tracking was not done on other makes, which actually should be confusing. Why would Price need to mark his own revolvers with his patent serials for royalty payment? Well, that's because there are two prices. The younger actually held the patent. Well, patents plural. The first was actually an alternative rebounding hammer design, one not owned by Fanyu. Price was co-owner of John Stanton's 1867 patent, which while depicted on a side lock, was equally applicable to a revolver. Ultimately, both the Fanyu and Warnant rebounding lockworks would be protected in England, so the Stanton rebound became very important which is why we find some revolvers of the era marked with some reference to Stanton's joint patent. Curiously, I've even seen it on Smith & Wesson's, which don't have rebounds. Price the Younger's unique patent of 1876 was actually just a cylinder stop. This served two purposes. First, it functioned as a sprag, preventing cylinder rotation when the trigger was released. 
or when the gun was at rest in the holster. It only allowed cylinder rotation as the trigger was being rotated, either by single or double action operation. Secondly, the stop was capable of being compressed back down into the frame. This was important as it was unlikely a shooter would manually align the stop slot in the cylinder when snapping the revolver back shut. Also take note, the turn screw for the cylinder release is already present, although not claimed in this patent. Now just to quickly finish up confusing points from earlier, I'm not sure who the heck Charles Price the Younger really is. Charles Price the Elder had two sons, Thomas and Lewis Price, who took on his firm in 1886 following his retirement. It's most likely that this younger Charles is a nephew or cousin, as the Prices really like reusing the same four first names. Okay, Belgian design from Kone. Extra work by Price. How does Philip Webley and Sons get involved? Well, by doing exactly what they did with the RIC revolver. One of those Tranter-derived Birmingham-type revolvers had hit it big thanks to aggressive advertising, uh, police and military purchases, and good follow-through on quality. The Webley Royal Irish Constabulary model had greatly increased their fortunes. For anyone curious, we've covered this firearm and a lot of early Webley history in a previous episode. The success of the RIC had come less from innovation and more from careful negotiation of the market, taking what was already popular in the market and running with it, and of course making minor improvements and delivering good quality examples, merging in features people want, right? Well, the Webleys knew that they couldn't rest on their laurels and looked for what would be the next turn in the market. As we covered, the most obvious direction would be self-extraction. In 1877, they bought out Tipping and Lauden, who had been making that Thomas's self-extractor revolver. Webley chose to bury it and focus on the price instead. Now, at the time, Webley already had the number one RIC, the number two pocket model, and the number three, which is a bit in between. It ditched the ejector and used a Tranter-esque arbor retention system. We'll see that in our next episode. It's no surprise that their next revolver would be the number four. The first iteration of this pistol was practically a clone of the Kone system, albeit with a more British lockwork. It hit catalogs by 1880, marketed as the Army and Navy self-extracting revolver, though was likely shipping well before, perhaps 1878 or 1879, some sources say as early as 1877. It was first chambered in the good old British 450 Adams cartridge. Now this used a two-piece case construction with the rim separate from the body. If one were to use a self-extractor, snapping it open smartly might just as well tear the rim off as eject the case, especially if the gun was allowed to be fired and left set. It's no wonder that the early extractors weren't as uh, fast in operation as you might expect. We get it open and then we go ahead and do that softly. They had to try and build up heavy torque with slow movement in order to pull that case successfully every time. The first Webleys were no exception. They were just like this little guy here, slow and steady. That wouldn't remain the case because the 450 Adams was a fairly weak cartridge and it was met with a fair bit of criticism. Uh, most of this came from actually the US adoption of the much more powerful 45 Colt cartridge. A black powder powerhouse, this lead freight train proved to be too powerful for British sensibilities, as follow-up shooting took a smidge too long, especially for a nation more interested in double-action revolvers. In the end, we actually see a compromised cartridge emerge with the adoption of a new Marshall revolver, the Enfield Mark I. Again, this is a design we've actually covered in detail before, one that somehow beat out the early price types despite its own issues. However, it did see the adoption of a new cartridge, one that split the difference between the old 450 and the American 45. This was the 455 Mark II, because the Mark I was a very short-lived initial attempt. Its longer case meant changes to cylinder length, but its solid drawn brass case was even more influential on the British market. Because now there was no fear of tearing rims off. There was also no fear of just snapping your revolver open for quick ejection. And if the extractor popped right back in, well, it should no longer risk carrying along some fragment of a case and resulting in some sort of jam and having to clear it all out, which would have been really annoying and common on the 450s. So when Webley extended their cylinder and bulked up for the new 455 cartridge, they also fitted a new component, one that can be spotted externally thanks to this paddle. 
It works like the Tranter 1879. Pressing the button prevents the extractor from engaging. However, it might have been too much like the Tranter 1879 or even the Smith & Wesson, which was also patented in Britain. That's because this design was actually very short-lived, with just a few noted examples remaining in the collecting world. Instead, Webley would quickly turn to producing their own unique solution to the snapback extractor problem. You can spot one of these guys by a little screw set high on the frame extension near the hinge. We can see the feature better though on Thomas and Henry Webley's 1881 patent. It covers a sort of flipper lever powered by a spring plunger to catch the extractor arm until a sort of cam lobe compresses it out of the way. Don't worry, we'll make this easier to see in a moment. Now, you might notice this patent doesn't depict a Kone-style revolver. That's because it was actually part of a series of patents around what would become the Webley Kaufman, a pistol that we'll cover another day. Another feature of the 1881 patent, by the way, is this rear collar, which was intended to seal off the arbor from any fouling or gases during firing. In later marketing, this would be called an anti-friction nut. Most Webley No. 4s you'll encounter are of the post-1881 variety. Though, serial numbers suggest that the old model did stick around specifically for the 450 cartridge, likely for a mixed purpose of using up old parts and because the 450 was again susceptible to tearing apart. Reasonably, any 455 revolver could also shoot the 450 cartridge, so the original design was bound to fade away. Now, what I have here is definitely a post-1881 Webley number 4, but it appears that this one goes further than that. My example likely emerged sometime around 1886 because it features two additional changes. The first is an out-of-battery safety patented by John Carter in 1884. It displays, but is not limited to, placing a pin in one of two positions to block either the trigger or the hand of the revolver lockwork whenever the left side latch is no longer sprung flush. The earliest version of this safety was actually a frame-mounted spring-loaded pin which would be depressed by the right side breech lever. It was soon realized that you could just affix a pin to the lever itself and leave a little hole in the frame. I should probably show you how that works uh, while taking a closer look at this guy right here. All right, we finally made it to the Webley number four, this being the brightest firearm I think we've ever had on the show because it was so popularly found with nickel plating, even in military service. <sighs> this gun is the most updated version of the number four. We have the improved little screw here that we'll see in a moment. We're a big 476 caliber. We are ready to rock and roll. So what have we got? Well. Coming from the Kone that we saw earlier, a lot of the same lines. We have our barrel rib, we have this sort of blocky construction, we have sort of a slab side, the frame's a little bit thicker, sure. But in terms of core features, well, we've got our two big paddles that we push to open her up, and we have our takedown lever here for removing the cylinder. That's all the same as before. Now, if we go ahead and pop this guy open, we'll find that at a certain point, we'll snap over. This is accomplished in a different way from the previous Kone. Let me show you. Right here we have our usual lever and it's pushed right up against the frame and yet right now we've gone ahead and retracted our extractor. How can that be? Well it's because there's a part hidden inside. Opening this guy up we actually have our little lever in there like usual that presses on our extractor in order to push our casings out. That lever is being tipped by this little tab here that I'm poking with my patented plastic pokey. That tab should snag under this flipper when the gun is closed. So let's just do that real quick. It's currently snagged, it's snagged, it's snagged. Once we get all the way open though, there'll be a little clunk. And with that clunk, sure enough, this guy is free to fall again. Had there been spring tension from the actual extractor, that would have happened all on its own. Now I know it's a little hard to see in there, but don't worry, we'll be able to see it better in the animation, especially the part where these guys right here, one of which is serving as a cam lobe to push on that paddle to release it at the right moment. No external parts necessary, like the Smith & Wesson or the Tranter. While I have the extractor out, let's talk about a couple things. One, we have, oh, look at that, three locator pins now and a much thicker extractor plate. This has been beefed up for military service. And on the side of the gun, you're gonna see that we have some scallop stops and what look like locking bolt locations. And they are in a sense, but as we'll see in a second, 
This is really only locking the cylinder when the gun is at rest, say, in the holster. It's not locking it as a sort of sprag to resist counter-rotation when the arm has been fired, you release the trigger, the hand wants to fall, you don't want the cylinder to bias backwards because then you end up refeeding the same cartridge over and over again. That resistance is actually provided by, well, the same spring that powers our extractor back down into the cylinder whenever we snap over. That spring is coiled in such a way as to pre present just a little bit of resistance to counter rotation, and that resistance is enough for the weight of a cartridge and the drag of that hand going the other way down these teeth. So that right there is our sprag function. So just to show it to you at rest, the trigger pops up this front stop, which is going to hold the cylinder in the uh, holster, prevent rotation. And as we pull the trigger, that lowers, allowing the cylinder to rotate. And this other guy rises at the rear. That's going to go ahead and hold the cylinder in correct alignment uh, against the hand in order to line up for the barrel and take our shot. This is also a little bit easier to see in our animation. Looking at the rear of the pistol, we still have our two locking blocks. And you may have noticed that those tabs that hold onto them have been buffed up. On the early 450 Webleys, these would have been just like the price, simple little pips. But by this time, they're getting quite robust in order to prevent being broken off, probably more from being dropped or mishandled than from actual firing. Now, uh, if I open this guy up, I wanna show you another feature of this gun, which is that there is a possibility, let's say, that you get some gunk or material stuck here at the rear of the gun. When you go to slam it closed, well, that went all the way down because we have no problems. But if we did, if we did have a little bit of gunk, you could conceivably in this be in this position here where there's a slight gap, the pins have not fallen, and you might not know because that same gunk might be holding the gun mostly shut. Well, that could be a big problem if you were to actually try to discharge around. The Webley, however, does not allow this. If I can just get that to hold in just the right spot, which is actually a little tricky, and try to pull that trigger or cock that hammer. Well, hold on, they went in. They gotta be out of battery. There we go. No good, can't do anything. Why? Well, let's look back at the rear again. The solution is ingeniously simple. It's this pin inside of here. See my pokey bump up against it? That pin is fixed to the right locking lever. So if this guy goes in, well, then the mechanism can't work. Now, of course, that does mean conceivably this could be locked and this could be unlocked, but that's still enough strength to keep the gun from giving you any trouble. Just with that little extra beast, you no longer have any out of battery worries. This is a feature unique to the Webleys. Being a later pattern number four, this is guaranteed to have Webley's winged bullet logo. And up top, we've got Webley's number four. And in this case, the firearm is marked for the 476 centerfire cartridge. A feature I'm told emerged in Webley's catalogs around 1886, though that would be well after the introduction of the Marshall cartridge, which introduced this nominal change. The Enfield Mark III, wherein the 455 bullet, which previously fit nicely inside the inner diameter of its case, was transformed into a healed design, where the now 477 inch diameter bullet was flush with the outer diameter of the case. This was done to improve the selective extraction process with the Army's Enfield revolver. Why 477 became 476 in the commercial market is still a bit of a mystery. Okay, that's our gun here explained, so I guess it's about time we finally got a look inside and see exactly how it works. Externally, the most obvious feature of the price type revolver is this pair of levers. Each is powered by its own spring, pressing outward at the base, causing the top to bias inwards. Each lever has a locking pin at its peak. These pass through both the frame and the top strap of the barrel assembly, keeping them locked together until we pinch the levers together, freeing the barrel assembly and allowing us to pivot it downward. The lockwork for this revolver was taken straight from the Webley RIC, itself a derivative of the Tranter. We'd recommend that episode for a deep dive on how it works as a whole. However, there is one difference here today. This little added extension on the trigger forms a second cylinder stop. It works in conjunction with the original. As we pull the trigger, the rearmost stop rises into a scalloped channel in the cylinder, halting its rotation at the right moment to align for firing. Releasing the trigger allows the new stop to spring into one of six new slots, 
locking the cylinder in place when the gun is holstered or otherwise handled. The other key difference is the hammer rebound. This is accomplished quite simply. The lower arm of the mainspring rests on an extension of the hammer. This causes it to bias into a rebounded position when left alone. However, dropping the hammer produces enough inertia to overcome the spring bias momentarily. This is when the primer is struck before the hammer bounces back. It's interesting to note that this basic added stop does not make use of a patent from Price. What we care about most, however, has to do with ejecting empty cases, so let's skip to that. This is the extractor star and its central rod. They are held flush to the cylinder by a central coil spring set inside the arbor. This little finger is what will soon overcome that spring, but only once it snags on this sear, which in turn is powered by its own spring and plunger. Let's watch. If we tip the barrel down, the finger snags on the sear, holding it in place against the extractor rod, which projects out of the cylinder and removes all six bent cases. After full compression, the finger is automatically released. That is accomplished by this oblong projection milled into the barrel assembly itself. This is a cam lobe, so when the barrel is tilted far enough, the peak of the lobe compresses the sear, freeing the finger and allowing the extractor to spring back into position. Alright, let's go shoot it. I'm not going to lie, out of all the early British revolvers we've shot, this and the RIC are the only ones that worked right out of the box, and the rest I had to sort of time and dress up. Okay, we've largely explained the evolution of this, the quintessential Webley number 4. However, this is still the era before Webley became a serial production factory. The number 4s were done the old way, farmed out parts, hand fitment, and in batches, albeit larger ones than usual, because it was fairly popular. That means there can be a fair bit of variation between individual Webley number fours, even more so if you happen to catch one of the sub-models. Core products include the aforementioned first, second, and third pattern number fours. Again, these are either 450, 455, later 476. There was also a number four and a half, which was just like the third pattern, but featured a five chambered cylinder and a shorter barrel, slightly handier. This is where we do have a little bit of a mystery of sorts, at least to me so far. The going theory on number four serial numbers, however, is necessary in order to understand what I'm talking about. Thanks to our friend Richard over at Arms Research UK, I kind of have an idea of what's going on. By the way, he does provide a lettering service for Webley's and Wilkinson revolvers, just like Colt or Smith & Wesson letters. Tell him we sent you. Anyway, thanks to him, we now believe that the Webley No. 4 started production at around serial number 80,000 and carried on for a little over 1,600 units. Then the serial started over at number 1, rising to around 500, and then there is an apparent gap in survey data which begins again around serial number 1,500. Here's the problem, the second pattern number four versus the number four and one half. Recall the second pattern came chambered for the 455 cartridge, but instead of the 1881 patent flipper release for the extractor, it uses a Tranter 1879 or Smith & Wesson style underside latch, 
which was serrated for use to prevent the extractor from engaging, again like the Trantor 1879. This pattern turns up in serials in the low hundreds. From my very limited observation, I mostly see 450 models in the early 80,000 serial block. However, there is at least one number four and a half clearly fitted with the 1881 flipper still in that 80,000s block. So either there was some interwoven production in the serial gap, which is honestly very likely, or this pattern was independently serialized, production dates unknown. Like I said, I'm hoping to have to redo this episode in a few years time. Maybe it's all inside out and upside down. So many mysteries to uncover. And of course, so far I've only mentioned the Webley Webleys. There are also two models of Webley Wilkinson to be considered. Wilkinson and Son, later known as Wilkinson Sword, was a firm founded back in 1775 by Henry Nock for the production of firearms and bayonets. With his death in 1804, the company transferred to his adopted son and foreman James Wilkinson, remaining in his family for the next century. Wilkinson was a well-known furnisher of military goods, particularly swords and sidearms for officers. Looking for the best product they could find, they began carrying Webley revolvers made custom for their shop and branded with their name. The first was clearly a simple offshoot of the core number four. Fitted with the 1881 flapper, it also sports the John Carter safety pin. This fancier Webley had a narrower barrel rib, nickel-plated foresight, and a German silver triangle set into the frame behind the rear sight, just like the one we saw earlier on our Frankot model. A bigger departure can be found in the Arbor release. The old turn screw is gone, replaced by a sort of button which was borrowed from the Webley Kaufman. This is likely in response to complaints that the knob was too easily spun unintentionally, resulting in an auto-ejecting cylinder. Wilkinson's second model, known as the 1888 to collectors, is an even stronger departure. Frankly, other than the latch, this has a lot more in common with what became the Mark I Webley service revolver. The hinge joint was made massive, the arbor released now a plain screw. The arbor itself was now protected at the front of the assembly by an inset collar patented by William Whiting in 1886. This feature came off of the now present Webley government line. The lockwork was slightly modified, notably one of the cylinder stops, but that's probably better explored some other day, as this really is the crossroads of several other Webley models. While Wilkinson was an important customer, their two Kone style revolvers were more the exception than the rule. Far more Webley number fours would be sold through the Army and Navy Cooperative Store. Their catalogs carried the number four from 1880 until 1896. In 1880, the 450 Adams first pattern would cost you four pounds three shillings blued. Nickel was four pounds nine shillings. In 1886, the number four and 476 could be had for three pounds 15 shillings six pence or four pounds even nickel. And in that same year, Webley began marketing their number four as the revolver sold to the Chinese Navy. This would have been the Qing Imperial Navy, and it sort of times out with the delivery of several ships made in Britain to China. Two in 1881 and two in 1886. I'm not sure how many or which were kitted out with Webley revolvers, but it's the most likely explanation for this claim. It also might explain the 1,000 unit jump in the known serial numbers. Number four revolvers were also fairly popular in South Africa, notably with the Boers, who would be amongst the last purchasers of this particular design. The Zweed Afrikanische uh, Republic, or Tsar, would strike a deal with Webley in June of 1896 for 400 number four revolvers, 300 deliverable immediately from a dealer in Cape Town, and another 100 from Birmingham stores. It's worth mentioning the local dealer had started with 400 to offer, but 100 had actually been sold commercially in the region before the deal could be struck, so there was certainly some demand. However, many, many more of the usual Webley stirrup latched Mark 1s, 2s, etc. would be favored for purchase going forward. Even so, being chambered for British service ammunition, I have no doubts that the number fours found themselves in service with the Boers in 1899. How they made out is anyone's guess. The only real story I can find that particularly names a price type revolver actually came out of the much earlier Battle of Isandwana. Considering this occurred in 1879, the revolver in question wasn't likely to be a Webley product, but supposedly it was a Kone patent lever-locked top brake. 
The story goes that Lieutenant Melville had to face the enemy with his sword instead of his revolver, as his cylinder had managed to discard itself all on its own back at the officer's tent. How true that claim is, I frankly have no idea. But what I do know is that May likely has some thoughtful opinions of her own on this guy right here. So let's go ask her what they are. All right, once more, we've made room for May. Hello. We have a pair of revolvers this time. We do. The Belgian Kone. Yep. And then Webley's iteration thereupon. So let's, it's actually hard because I don't know which one of these actually predates the other in this particular configuration. Mm -hmm. And I've never been able to figure out the origin of the takedown and very specific features like who was the first to do double paddles. Yeah. Mm. That's actually very frustrating. I can it, understand that. Hey, if you guys know of old catalogs that display these, send them to me. Uh, it'd be great. We have a contact form on the site. Um, maybe we can pin it down later on. But You, you know what's really interesting? Um, I'm looking at the two guns from the outside, and I know objectively, or I know on the inside, they are both fundamentally different um, mechanisms on the inside. Right. However, if you just look at them, just at the general features, they look pretty much the same. Yeah, and this is actually how the whole price name stuck. Um, neither of these are prices. Right. Neither of these have patents that are from price, Charles Price. Mm -hmm. Arguably, one has a rebound that was partially owned by Price, but was invented by a man named Stanton. That is still debatable to some degree in right. terms of where, who can you really credit because of the way Stanton's system biased versus the way this sort of actually bounces back. But <clears throat> we have the Kone out of Belgium, mm -hmm. made by August Francot. Yep. Can you give me some first impressions on this? Assuming, let's do a little, let's do a little experiment. Are you ready? Let's pretend that we're from an older era of solid frame single loaders like this Colt 1878. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time we're seeing something like this. Okay. Now describe it to me. Okay, so you don't want me to go through my normal bit? No, no, go through your normal bit, okay. but also add in some like, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, all right, well, obviously this thing is massive, um, incredibly <laughs> Two long. Two and a half pounds. Yeah, that is, uh, this has to be the longest revolver we shot for the series, right? You think so? With, uh, Gasser 1870 and 74. And then the Reich's revolver, the Reich's 79. Revolver. Those are the two biggest I can think of. This is definitely in that class. I think this might be the longest one. Well, it we, definitely looks like it. We'll, we'll have to hold it up, it up on the screen. Can... Yeah. So. Um, but uh, so aside from that, it's obviously very front heavy. Like that's going to definitely uh, weigh on me as I go to shoot it. Um, hopefully help with a little bit of recoil there, although high <laughs> bore axis. Um, and then, okay, so I'm used to the solid frames. I'm used to having an ejector rod or right. shoot like a Rex revolver, have to pick up a stick off the ground or something. So I give you this thing and you're going... Where's, where's my rod? Oh, I guess I was going to be a Rex revolver. I'm just going to... Wait, no, I can't get a case out the backside of that. Where's my gate? Where's my rod? <gasps> what is this? This is some Smith & Wesson magic because that's <laughs> the only comparable thing before this. That's true. That actually is the only comparable thing. But even from the Smith & Wesson, may I point out, there is a lot going on on that gun. You've got two paddles, a turn knob, and then if you really know what you're looking at, there's like a little tiny lever down here. Yeah, there's a lot of weird little angles and boodles sticking out and then what is with this ornate? It almost looks like a button. Don't you want to press it? It looks like a button, but then also it's really like a lot of design work went into just that. It's kind of unnatural. Um, it appears to be a casting of some sort that they then jammed in there. Okay. That particular one, given the age of the gun, finally wore down and got loose. So uh, technically that's glued in there right now. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> it kept just blooping right back However, out. However, I mean, we've used playing cards for other things before and stuff like that. Oh, playing so. cards make great shims. Oh, they really do. Um, <laughs> Um, so, yeah, no, this is definitely not a system I'm familiar with going from that, and entirely familiar with, at least. Um, and then the fact that it's two paddles, it's really weird. It feels flimsy, almost. It doesn't really feel like this is a very solid setup. And I know, objectively, it actually is a pretty solid latching well, I'll tell system. You what, press one of the paddles right. and open the gun. Right. Now press the other paddle. No, no, I meant with the... You just look, I'm just it's, doing what you told it's me. It's a do. beautifully redundant system in the sense that it is evenly supported. It is. And, and it would need to be blasted and open somehow from both sides in order right. to actually open the gun. Cool. It's a double fail safe. Now, there are such things as single pin systems that use cascading pins. Uh, we'll see this on the Kaufman. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of things, but that Kaufman's giving us some trouble. And we don't have an episode oh. out anywhere near soon about it because 
keeps blowing open because it has only one latch and that latch is somehow flexing and it's allowing the system to open up. I will say one bad thing is that I can operate the gun as far as pulling the trigger and finding well, the hammer fall. Just to get ahead of ourselves. With the action open. With the action all the way open, I can operate this one as well. Seems weird, right? This no, seems like because you shouldn't be able to that's do harmless. That. There's nothing there to be I mean, interacting. There is with. nothing there, I guess. What you're afraid of is when it's barely almost closed, but not quite closed. That's what I'm thinking. Is like, eh, I think I can do right it. Right there. Yeah. yeah, like right here. Mm -hmm. Can that still? Can that? Oh be? yeah, definitely it can. Oh okay. Um, that one does not have the safety. Although that being said, I did just notice that when you go to pull the, the hand, hammer, naturally the wants hand to naturally push pushes. Okay, so maybe that honestly just kind of saves itself there a little bit. Under ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. If you imagine that thing's actually jammed up with mud, or like if we, I don't have one with me now. We just mentioned the playing cards. If we jammed a playing card in here mm -hmm. vertically and managed to cram the, actually two, if, well, there's not enough room, but you get this the idea. This is a very intricate setup. Well, I'm imagining fouling and grit and rust, right? And some of the we've playing been, cards. We've been in service. If you slam that shut and mm -hmm. it doesn't quite get the pips over, mm -hmm. You can still pull the trigger yeah, on that gun. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, an even simpler solution, what if this filled with mud, right? Just yeah. that hole, and you close it up, and those can't go in. Mm -hmm. It would still go bang. True. Whereas on this guy, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. He has the safety system. If mm -hmm. this guy doesn't close on the right-hand side at least, no bang. Right. So brilliant little system. Sure. Can't argue with that. Um, And then we have the RAC grip here. Right. Uh, it's not my favorite grip, history-wise. It's also, I know that you can, these aren't really exactly uh, the best for dropping. <laughs> not that I plan to go around throwing my gun around. Well, this one's already been chewed all up and re-glued oh, yeah. and somebody oh, put their initials yeah, in it. PM. <laughs> Thanks, PM. Yeah, it's nighttime. Um, and that being said, it, it, it does create an awkward angle, too. I feel very far away from the trigger if I want to line up with it linearly. I'm not on the knuckle with this one, unfortunately. Are you? That, that keeps happening to you. Now, this is a fairly girthy grip, and yeah, it puts thick. me almost to the knuckle. I'm a little high, but to be honest with you, I can work the gun fine from there. Okay. I can operate both levers without disturbing my grip, and I really haven't done much. So to me, this is actually fairly good. I like these single piece grips in my hand when they are contoured properly to my hand. Right. They feel excellent. Uh, I believe we saw something like this on the Trantor 1868, which fit your hand. Yes, it uh, did. Um, I love them. However, they do like uh, they do present sort of a weakness in the sense that the there is no back strap of actual metal. Right. So if you drop it on the back, you're going to get a crack. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so that, that pretty much covers, I want to say, the looks on this guy. And the brief ergos, the handling, I guess? Yeah, pretty much. Um, Let's load her up. Yeah, okay. Oh, don't do all that yet. we got to load her up. I'm with it for a second. I can do that if I want. Obviously, I can just pop her down with mm -hmm. the ejector rod, and I can just load in my rounds, close it back up. And then I do like what you pointed out, is that the pins actually have a taper on here, so I can just slam that shut. Right. Solid. Good. Done. Okay. Perfect. Um, single action. Hammer's actually pretty light, um, not incredibly smooth. And For that period, that is a very light hammer. Yeah, I'm just surprised at how light that is. Probably because it's commercial market for commercial ammo, or because British ammo wasn't nearly as insensitive as American ammo was. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> hammer from hell. 45, only way to go. <laughs> sure. Um, and then I did notice that the single action trigger pull is a little squishy, just a little spongy. Yeah, well, to be fair, this thing... Uh, was left out in a shed for 50 of its 100 years. Okay, so shed sponge. I have done a lot of work to recover this gun from the condition that it was found in. I can tell, because the double action is creaky. Yeah, that again is probably not the lockwork's fault. Yeah, that's fair. I'm still gonna blame it a little bit. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Um, that is a standard Fonyu lockwork, by the way, which mm -hmm. we see in other things like, actually weirdly, that has Fonyu in it. Yeah. This has a Tranter derived lockwork with a sear and everything. More on right. that in a second. You can see it. The Webleys that we think of when we think of Webleys, the Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the Mark 4 38s that you see in World War II, all of them Fonyu lockworks. Hmm. So weirdly, the lockwork in this is, this is more like a Webley than this Webley. Huh. Yeah. That is weird to think about. Yeah. Um, and then the sights on this guy. Why are they this fine for how long of a sight rate? I mean, I, am I going to be doing some long distance shooting with this revolver? Is that what's it expected is, of it me? It is the LaCroix of rear sights. It I has a hint of rear sight. But I do love that they understood these are really fine sights. We need to make a way so that the shooter can try to get to them 
faster. They put a nice little silver triangle here on the back. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Can't find the rear sight. There it is, right, right there. Yeah, it's actually it helps me. And the I thought it was pretty perfect for that. The rear sight's so fine that they went. We better checker the top of that. It's actually hard to see. Oh on there. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell. So they it's checker the top to reduce glare. Checkering. So you can find the little hint. It's, it's like it's wanna, really fine wanna, checkering too. You know what I want to be? I want to be the guy in the factory that was responsible for cutting that rear sight channel because he's just sitting there going zick zick done mm -hmm. zick zick done. And yet it's got this nice deep, the thing is, so it's got this little tiny bit right here for the rear sight, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, right ahead of it is this giant cavernous dish. dish. Yeah, that's to, open, that's to really let some more light in there so that you can actually see the rear sight and get a sharp contrast with the front sight. But then why can't we just continue all that on down? Because then it would be a big wide bucket and you wouldn't know where to put the front sight for fine shooting. It's clear that this thing's more oriented for target shooting, especially with that long barrel and that fine front and oh, rear sight. Oh, well, yeah, that's clearly what it's for. Yeah, the front sight, I believe, is beaded, isn't it? Yes, it is. So how would you feel shooting that, assuming better condition, uh, at, say, 50 yards? Do you think you could hit something at 50 yards pretty easily? Yeah, I think so. No, no rush, but just actually being able to Yeah, I definitely think so with I, how fine these sights are. I do, too. With that barrel length and that rear sight, I suspect, good. I suspect in mint condition this could be a 100-yard gun. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see some differences in a second. <laughs> so uh, let me Speaking take that, that from you. Uh, I, I, this is good for me, but let's talk Pass about this guy. Pass me the Number four, actually made by Webley. Ooh. What stands out right away to you? That it's nickel plated. Mm -hmm. And that everything nickel plated I've ever been handled has something broken or has been sprayed all to heck with WD-40 on the inside. <laughs> and it's sticky as a result. It is wild how many springs are broken in nickel guns for no reason at all. I just don't understand why and how every single one has been in terrible condition. This was the first one that it hasn't. Yeah. It was beautiful. So obviously, let's go with the just differences real quick. Okay. Nickel plated. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, to shorter, be fair, this has no coating whatsoever left on it. Right. Shorter barrel length. Obviously, the weight's improved. Um, balance. Balance is better. Yeah, definitely. However, and it looks like the bore axis is higher on this guy. How is that uh, possible? It can't be possible. It looks like it. Is that possible? I think it is. Is that possible? Uh, slightly lower, actually. Oh, am I looking at it weird? Um, I'm just trying to pull it from the, the middle of the trigger, which is kind of hard to emphasize, but I'm looking at the deepest part of the triggers. I'm lining them up. What do you think? Oh, do maybe they are just dead on. Uh, they look dead on. Oh, on. Now let me turn it the other way. This is what we do live, folks, for you. Oh, yeah, 100%. No, it's slightly... Sl eh, same or slightly lower. Okay. Right, here you go. Um, and then the grip itself, I did notice, identical in... Shape. Ish in shape. However, these are a little bit thinner. They feel a little bit better for me. They definitely are flatter. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a girthier grip. Which it it's not the worst. I like but this. I think the thinner is better. You like I think that. It just fits better. Your hands are smaller. Yeah, and I'm also as a result like I'm not having to reach around it as hard. Can you, I can line up with the trigger better you, on this side. Can guy. you hold your grip, your natural grip for shooting? Okay. And then wow, that's a little low. Okay, your natural grip for shooting. Okay. And then reach your reach your tabs. No, I can't reach the tabs. Is your, your thumb's too My short? My thumb's too short. Even on that one. Thumb is too short. Yeah, see, I can do it even on the big boy. I have big, long, you know. Man thumbs. Yeah. Man thumbs will this, do it. This is the one problem we have you as our designated markswoman because you're the same height as someone of this era. Yeah. You do not have hands. the man no, hands. No, I don't have man hands. You have little lady hands. Dang. I can never have the full... Full feel to give to the guys. <laughs> it's not as bad on rifles, but boy, does it show up on these revolvers. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, and then, essentially, everything else really kind of comes down to the feel on this guy for comparison. Okay. What's the feel difference? So, the hammer feels slightly heavier, but dang if it is not smooth. And the trigger pull, both single and double, actually pretty clean. Yeah. Although, no, wait. The single, I think, is a little bit squishy. I got I to gotta defend my boy here. Single's still slightly squishy, but everything else is still smoother and overall. My boy was left in a rat's nest for 50 <laughs> years. Your boy was left in a drawer. Okay, okay. <laughs> Give me a little credit. Here. A drawer and then Grandpa did not get a hold of it. <laughs> I'm going to point that out. Grandpa didn't touch it, even yeah, though it was nickel plated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, they should be able to walk in the house and <laughs> smell it. You know how Grandpa walks in and is like, there's a nickel plated gun here somewhere. <laughs> they start opening drawers, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's funny though, the screws on these have been tampered with a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the screws on these have of all the, this gun looks like it's been dragged behind the boat, right? The screw heads are perfect. Nobody was in this gun before me. Someone definitely went into this gun, ooh, and tried and failed to 
Open this gently. Hollow ground wow, screwdrivers, some of these folks. Are do not take your regular screwdriver that you buy at Lowe's and use it on a firearm. It will tear up the heads of the screws. Look at this one right here. Like you can clearly you tell they slipped. Down. Don't show it down. Okay, fine. So <laughs> anyway, so function wise, this already feels a lot better, and the sights are even better. Although, admittedly, not for target shooting. Uh, they're kind of. Well, technically, they're not great actually they're, for they're revolver bigger, sights. But they're blobby. Yeah, how is that pot? I think this might be the. Weird. These are some really deep set V notch. It's like it's just a really wide V notch that's very shallow in the back, mm -hmm. with a with a, with a half moon front. Yeah, but it's soft. Uh, so yeah. Here's my question. It doesn't really work well, does it? Can you shoot that reliably at fifty yards? No. Just off the sights. But I mean, this would be better for a shorter range. Definitely. That's what I'm saying. So, fifty to hundred yards. Th this. Yes. Okay, uh, someone bearing down on you, and you are trying to at least draw a sight beat at, let's say, 30 yards. This. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. That's just better for long range, but that's, again, that does really now, seem just like target shooter. cylinder dumping at two feet. This? Not this. Because I'm not using the sights on either one, and this has reduced the two feet by one foot. <laughs> uh, okay. Ha ha. Very funny. Uh, You're so proud of yourself. Yeah. I'm a smart guy. Okay. Um, but realistically, those are just the major differences between the two. And then, obviously, difference in cartridge shooting. So we did shoot 450 out of that guy, and yet this one had that 455. Right. How was that? A little different. Short, um, shorter barrel, lighter gun, heavier cartridge. It was more recoil. What could have happened? Oh, God. I don't know. But the know. grip was a little more comfy for you. Yeah, it was. It did feel better. However, you're not wrong. The recoil was definitely different. It was stouter. <laughs> But that's okay. Not unmanageable, just stouter. Yeah. Yeah. Now, out of all the wacky sort of offbeat revolvers we've shot, mm -hmm. I want to point out something. Okay. You decidedly enjoyed that one on range because we put I six. Did. We put six rounds in. You fired six rounds. You ejected six rounds. We were done. Now hold up. Yes, we did. That is what happened. It performed well. That's not it's all that was that day. Perfect performance. Everything else that day that should have done well, it required multiple takes. Look, it was smooth. So. It was smooth and light compared to everything else you were shooting that day. Uh huh. Uh, I think that's the day that we tried shooting a Smith and Wesson double action Navy. Y yeah, which the we number, still have to refill what, the number because. Three? Oh God, that gun. Yeah. That's that another was episode horrible. for another day. That was horrible. Yeah. So. I never stitched that because I looked at it and went, oh, God, that's going to be a terrible thing to stitch. No, no, it's worthless. Yeah. That gun is... Anyway, I don't know what Smith & Wesson was doing. Um, <laughs> he was gone that blowing day. Blowing a future episode. He was just gone that day. Uh, he left it to Timmy in the break room to figure out. You quite enjoyed that the day of. I did because I honestly, after the day we had, everything was shooting terribly. So I thought, oh, here we go. Grandpa's gun out of the drawer. It's going to be terrible, too. And then it wasn't, mm -mm. and it just ran, and then we were done within the first shoot. It didn't stack any weird friction. Nope. It didn't do any of the bar bizarre stuff we saw. It just shot, which mm -hmm. is actually the most you can ask for, realistically. Oh, yeah, especially with these old guns, and one that you hadn't taken apart. You just did a quick spritz on it, Yeah, and it was just working. So between Perfect. the two, do you have a preference? So I should prefer the one with the fawn new lock work because I remember you yelling about having to do the timing for Tranter lock works. <laughs> However, <laughs> personal experience, this one was way better. The number four was way nicer to me. I think it's built more ruggedly too. I've noticed comparing the two, the, the barrel assembly on this one is sort of, it's been relieved almost like a Colt single action army. Mm -hmm. It wraps over the frame, whereas on this guy, the frame wraps over the barrel extension. It's sure. cut like a big slab. There's, as much as this is the larger gun, there's a lot more meat in this gun. This is more ruggedized. Sure. Assuming that the lock work is fresh, I would probably choose the number four over <gasps> this Kone. He's saying he picked something over a, a Fanyu lock work? What's well, wrong with you? It has the safety. Uh huh. No, it's not that I prefer Fonyu Lockworks. I do in the sense that Fonyu Lockworks are single threaded within the lock I'm just and therefore saying. easier to time and fall out of time less. They're less likely to fall out of time. They're easier to service. There's a reason why it became the preeminent military lockwork. Mm -hmm. I don't like working on Tranter and Webley Lockworks that use a sear because they're multi threaded. You have to time the sear against the hammer, against the cylinder, against the trigger. It's, it's a pain, right? I know. Um, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I don't even know what I I'm even, being. I didn't even do it. I remember no, they the yellow. I, I do. I do like the out uh, of battery safety. 
that's a major feature improvement. Even yeah. though it would be a rare occurrence, it still would be a very critical occurrence when it happens. It's nice to think that they put some thought into that. They yeah. went, oh, okay, let's just make this a little safer if we can. Yeah, sure. I mean, cool. Brilliant. But uh, overall, mm-hmm. coming from this sort of era of the single shot, single loader. Yep. Realistically, the only thing that we've seen up to this point, if we sort of retract everything we know about future revolvers, the, the only thing we've seen that's an extractor is a Smith & Wesson number three single action. Yes. And unfortunately, single action. Right. So between the Smith & Wesson and this, who do you choose? This, obviously. I have my double and my uh, single action that I can choose. Nothing's going to... Double action is always going to defeat single action. Do you have any doubts about using this lockwork? Does it scare you at all? Why? Well, just because of the, the little flappers, I mean... Oh, well, I mean, looking at the Kaufman blow itself open, that was cool, but that's a totally <laughs> different setup in some ways. I don't even think and we, that, we keep talking about, we don't even have footage of that no, because it was don't. like in a ransom rest, just like... Well, we also didn't think it was going to replicate itself and then it did and went, okay, I guess we're not doing that again. Oh my God. Um, but the fact that this one at least has the double full fail proof where it's, it, you'd have to blow open from both sides, whereas right. the Kaufman's a single direction, so... Okay. Arguably, this one is safer. Okay. It does personally make me nervous in general, does but it? a little bit. Just I, because of the weird paddles on the side? I guess, yeah. They feel very flimsy. They don't feel, <laughs> it doesn't feel like a very solid system, and they're so easy to depress to open up. So I guess me personally, I'm like, oh no, there should be a little more weight behind having to actuate those levers. No, it doesn't take much pressure at all. Okay. Well. I guess that's got us resolved then, right? Yeah, probably. Any final thoughts on these guys? Um, Interesting to be able to try. I was glad to finally actually test one out because we've seen pictures of all these and never actually personally handled one in person. Yeah, I think they're great. And for mm-hmm. the time period, they're frankly amazing. If you think about how much time was lost trying to eject singular cases, mm-hmm. and now you can just boom, all of them out, even if you don't speed up the loading process. And I know mm-hmm. people are thinking Purdue loader and stuff. Those come out later. They're not here yet, right? And then fresh at the time, they were in they were in good shape. There yeah. wasn't any real risk or concern at that time for you know them to eventually be working themselves out of time, essentially. Um, I mean, there was, as we're going to see in our next episode, a lot of the old guard did not trust this newfangled top break thing. And Webley has well, a gun. How quickly did they work themselves out of time? That's a hard question to answer, actually. A um, hundred years later, often. Top, yeah. top breaks have a weakness to them. Most of them are out of time these days. And you should be careful if you're picking up an old antique top break and you don't know how to time a revolver. Shaving is very likely, if not other problems, and shaving on giant lead rounds can be really dangerous. Oh, yeah. So, But my um, thing is, fresh from the factory? Probably not that big of a risk. True, but we're having the hindsight of dealing with modern revolvers that have all sorts of systems in them that we think are okay. At the time, you're being asked to take something that you have the knowledge of based off of marketing. You know Mm -hmm. how much you trust marketing these days. (laughs) And then you're told that you're going to go halfway to all the way across the world. And then you're going to have to use it for one or two years at a time Mm -hmm. in an environment where it's horrible uh, there might be sand, there might be water, there might be salt water, there might be who knows what, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's going to be people there that very much want to kill you on occasion. So you might think to yourself, I'm going to bet everything on six rounds quick, never a single problem, mm-hmm. versus being able to get another six rounds out in a hurry. It's kind of an iffy pick. Yeah, you're not wrong. Um, I hate, you know, in hindsight, we're going, yeah, this is the way to go. But at the time, how much do you really trust advertising? Fair. Versus what you knew worked. so And what you're familiar with. Yeah, that's true, too. All right. Uh, I think this one's got in the bag. Yeah, I think so. Um, this episode, I don't believe we have any executive producer for this episode of my No, no one specifically named this one out. Okay. Um, so the executive producer slot wide open, but we do have to thank someone. Okay. Which is my homie, Brandon. Oh, yeah, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, Brandon's the one that hooked me up with this guy at a fair rate, and I rebuilt it. So I'm just going to go ahead and give him a thanks because he was very fair about the condition, and uh, he let me take it what I consider to be the appropriate price for the condition it's in, mm-hmm. which is probably not what other people would try to charge me these days. <laughs> so fair. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, we got it running, and it's done a wonderful job for the show. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how long it'll stay running. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, I think that's got us wrapped up. I think so. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching. Yeah, thank you all, and check us next time. We appreciate it.
Um, but lovely gentleman. Oh yeah, wonderful guy. He went. He was like, "You want access to everything? Shoot, just tell me which cases to open." So he unlocked it all and let us take pictures and let you take video of well, we essentially now, whatever we now was have there. An insane number of photos of high condition cult prototypes and some savage stuff too. Yeah, it's true, and some other stuff. Yeah, but we took a bunch of photos of interesting things while we were there. But I was only really focused in on the 1909. Mm-hmm. I believe I got some parade footage of each model so that we can stitch it in for the recap on the 1911 episode. Yep. I didn't realize how much the Tau Flighter Mouse channel is jazz. You know, I watch what he does. He's yeah. been my friend forever. I didn't realize it was jazz. Yeah, no, he's, he's just, just he's always jazzing it up. He's tooting his horn whichever way it wants to go. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And he plays his song and <laughs> that band better keep up. <laughs> so poor May and I are trying to like keep rhythm with this. There is no rhythm. No. But we're trying. And it's the funniest film session I think we've ever had. Mm-hmm. I, I the, most of the episodes are up. The only thing he hasn't put up, and I don't know if it's going to or not, because we never got footage of the damn thing in flight. Yeah, was the gyro pigeon. We you know, talking. I we need to double check. Are we sure we didn't have anything on our phones for that day? I don't. I never caught any flight because I I was told that he had it on that one camera of his, and I said, "Are you sure?" And then you were busy filming with him. I'm gonna double check it one more time just to make sure. Okay. Because um, he does have high speed of the gyro pigeon, like horrifying oh, yeah. high speed of the gyro pigeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to see that. We need to see that. Mm-hmm. I don't even care if he releases a short. We need to see that. Mm-hmm. And there are two gentlemen to my right at a computer screen, and all of a sudden I hear "cook clunk," and I went, "Shit, that's me bolting a tea giver forward." And he went, "Nope." <laughs> the elder man went, "Nope." You're the one with the tea giver, and I went, "No, no." No, I, I heard that one because I was on the other side of the room. Uh-huh. I heard "cook clunk," uh-huh. and I was just like, "Uh oh," because I heard the tea giver <laughs> yeah. bolt right, and then one of them goes. You're the Tiga Bear girl. Yep. <laughs> like all of them go, that's you. They didn't even look at the screen. No. That was a known like yeah. concept was the girl with the Tiga Bear. If you have partials, if you have live ammo and you're just checking on it and you don't want to send it all flying, you have the option when the action is closed to go ahead and press this button down here where my thumb is at. If you hold that button down, it disengages our extraction mechanism, which means that nothing pops out.